apologize for that. The mic wasn't in front of me. Let me start over. Good evening. I am Selwyn Collins of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. I want to thank you very much, those of you who are joining us for the first time. Um, thank you for tuning in. And the regulars, thank you as well for tuning in, tuning in every week with me. Um, I want to talk a bit about stepping away. Today, a friend of mine called, and um, we were, you know, talking about life. You know, how are you? How are you doing? And so on. And, um, and I mentioned to her that I was a little bit tired. You know, I was working on a project, and I put my own timeline on it and pressuring myself. And so I was tired, and I couldn't solve the problem. And, you know, so she gave me one of my own anecdotes, and she said, um, well, step away. And then she mentioned a, a, a scripture, I think it was, um, Mark 631, about coming away by yourselves and rest a while. And I want to talk a little bit about that because, you see, I, I believe that solutions are always there. And when we can't figure something out, it is very important for us to recognize that there is time to take a rest. Just, just step away, whatever the situation is whether it's in a relationship, I'm not saying give up on your relationships, I'm just saying step away, be still, recalibrate, discharge and recharge. Very, very important. How many times have you been working on a problem and can't figure it out? You're just frustrated, anxious, irritable, and then you step away. And when you return or you go to bed, you get up next morning and Voila, the solution is there. So I'm here to remind you tonight that when you're faced with a problem, step away. The other thing we talked about today is about complexity. I personally believe that complexity is a combination of simplicities. If you have a problem, you have a complex problem, find a way to break it up. Separate the different parts and soon you will discover that that particular problem is no longer complex. So my advice tonight is, or suggestion, do not be scared to step away. Do not be afraid to postpone. I'm not saying procrastinate. I'm saying postpone with the intent to do. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, let me formally introduce you to CWS. CWS is about having conversations with people about their journeys and how are they using their gifts and talent to help others? How are you contributing to humanity in a positive way? You know, I, I'm, I'm always hoping that in these conversations, the audience comes away learning something, being inspired, being enlightened, but more importantly, the youths who I have a vested interest in helping in transforming in encouraging because they are the future of our they are our future what i hope is that during these conversations especially when a guest speaks of their challenges and how they overcame their challenges my hope is that someone out there can be encouraged to step beyond their limitations and their challenges this to me is success when you can just by virtue of sharing your experiences, sharing some of your challenges, help to transform someone. To me, it starts a chain reaction of positiveness. So without much further ado, I'll take a break. And when I get back, I'll introduce you to our guest tonight, Jasmine Edwards. Thank you. 
We are back. Good evening for those of you who are now joining us. I am Selwyn Collins, your host on CWS Conversations with Selwyn. My guest tonight is Jasmine Edwards. Jasmine, good evening. Good evening. How are you? I am fine. Thank you for coming on to CWS tonight. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I'm sure many others by, by the, the activity on Facebook I am quite confident that many others are looking forward to this conversation. So, Me too. <laughs> um, so Jasmine, let, let's, let's just start off with one, a very simple question. You know, um, who is Jasmine O. Edwards, ESQ? Jasmine Campbell Overton Edwards, ESQ. Mm. Um, that's my whole long I apologize. Time. Yeah, yeah. Didn't realize. I am a daughter, a sister, a friend. I'm an attorney. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, basically, I think I was I put here to help people. So in any way that I can do that through my education, my knowledge, my resources, that's pretty much what I do all day. I was a social worker before I became an attorney an attorney because I wanted to make more. And then I figured that behind this. So here I am. Okay. Um, I just realized that sometimes or occasionally, I hope it, it, it doesn't um, escalate. You'll get a little sticking from your recept from your um, broadcast from your end. So oh. let, let's, let's continue. If, you know, if it happens, I will just pause. Um, just let the audience know that if this happens, I will just stop talking. And so, okay. we, you know, we don't really miss anything. Right. So, wow. Thank you. Um, tonight, you know, your, your, your ad is about law according to me. Yeah. <laughs> and if I knew what I know now about law and I mean that 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 speaks volumes and and it's ambiguous and it's you know it raised eyebrows and well what does this mean? But let's start with law according to me. What 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 does that mean? From the time that I was a child, I just knew I wanted to become an attorney. I have an aunt who still lives in Guyana. Her name is L. V. Edwards. She's been practicing for probably 50, 60 years now. Whoa. And I was home for a funeral garb with the wig and all of that and I said wow what do you do and when she explained to me what her role was in the community I wanted to be just like her and so it's been a lifelong journey for me and I finally entered law school with dreams and aspirations of helping people who look like myself mm -hmm. may not have had the um, opportunities and knowledge and experience that I had um, and help them along their own journeys you know I New York and it was just because of a couple of steps to the right that I didn't end up like some of my clients who are behind bars or in family court or you know what have you um, unfortunately I learned that law is much more of a business than a human service industry and so if you don't have great business acumen even being a really great attorney you may not reaching and helping people so it's been a 10 year journey for me now, but um, well worth it. Well worth it. You know, I, I, I am of this school of thought that it takes nine years of incubation, you know, and then on the 10th year, it's a rebirth. <laughs> it's, the, it's, it's the birth of something new. And I, I understand that it was something new, but we'll talk about that later on. Um, I okay. still wanna f zero in on this, um, on your affair with law. <laughs> Yeah. Your, your brush with law. Um, you mentioned your aunt and you know, her in, uh, inspiring you, um, her being a role model and so on. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, when my aunt and my mother and her siblings were growing up in Guyana, there was no university in Guy of Guyana. You mm. know, my grandmother was born in 1900. So, you know, without giving out my um, family's ages, which they would kill me for, Obviously, they were living in a different time. There was, there was certainly no law school for them to attend in Guyana, so they had to travel abroad. Mm -hmm. My aunt went to Oxford. She went to England to study law, um, and she went as far as Nigeria to practice, but she came back home to serve her community, and she was able to help a lot of people, 
and make a good living for herself. And I just thought that what she did was amazing um, as a woman. Yes, of course. She helped I'm, people mm -hmm. um, who had no voice and who were not able to help the role model. Um, she was very, very well read and learned and all of that. And I really just admired her acumen and um, her standing in the community. So I wanted to mimic that, but I lived in the States. So it was a very different situation. Mm -hmm. But, but the idea of being a lawyer, I was still. Oh, um, it, it is sticking a little bit, but let, let's continue talking. Um, okay. You, you were saying that you wanted to mimic that and, you know, living yes. in the States, that's a whole different story, but yes. you had nine years or 10. I mean, you're still doing it, aren't, aren't you? Yeah, this is, this will be my 11th year. 11th year. Wow. Wow. And um, so yeah. what we hear about, well, what I'm hearing here is role model. I'm hearing here respect. Um, so yes. tell, tell us how important it is to you to have a role model. It's very important. I mean, for me, even though I was definitely focused on my goals and was achieving them, it wasn't until my third year of law school, which is the final year, that an attorney came into one of the classes I was taking. Her name happened to be Ellen Edwards, of no relation, a woman of Africa. She came into our class to speak about her day as a lawyer. And seeing her kind of brought everything home for me because I said, wow, someone who looks like me is actually out there doing this. Because, you know, what you see on TV, like right now we have scandal and law and order, that's not. When I took the bar, um, it was in July of, I guess, 2002, there were 10,000 students who took the bar at the same time. And I saw every student of color that I knew because we were just, you know, little chocolate drops in a big glass of milk. Mm. So when you come out of school and enter the real world, it's very different than practicing, you know, in your own school or whatever else. So. It was quite a culture shock to be in old school club, and so you have. It's um, patient. The reception is kind of kind of bad. It it stopped just now. After okay. you said culture shock, could you repeat what what you said after culture shock? I was saying it was there was a culture shock for me once I finished with the bar and all of that to actually enter the practice of law. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what was that like to you? What, what were you present to? I mean, how, what well, was this um, culture shock like to you? It was difficult. I remember at the time I actually had my hair in locks mm -hmm. and I said, well, maybe if I cut my hair, they'll recognize me as an attorney. Even now they still ask me, are you an attorney? Let me see your ID. Ooh. It's, it's hard for them to wrap their heads around the fact that someone who looks like me practices law wow. versus the board of education was decided many, many years ago. We were allowed to go to the same schools. The schools are not segregated. There are black people doing all kinds of things, you know, get over it, but it's still a big problem in the community. So for me, it was a culture shock because my mother taught me, if you do your best at whatever it is you're doing, you'll be recognized and you'll be able to have a good life, but it's not exactly the case in my profession. So, so, so yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so, so you had to develop certain skills to cope. Hard work alone. Not in Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I usually ask my guests, well, where did this all start? Because I love to explore the guest timeline just to give us a kind of um, perspective on who they are and how they got to where, where they are and so on. Not necessarily to get a bio, um, but to get some idea. Well, you know, what informed your decision to do certain things. And you, you went right into it. You spoke about your aunt being an attorney in Guyana and, and you know, inspiring you and so on. Right. And, but did you know that you always, I mean, from since then you knew you wanted to do law and you never wavered? Did, did anybody ever um, try to dissuade you or point you in another direction? No, mm -hmm. no, I'm, I'm a consummate, um, I don't wanna say I argue a lot, but I do. <laughs> Is this argue case or you argue your case with anybody? With anyone, oh, especially, okay. especially 
saying does it make sense i'm not gonna let you say just because that's part of it as well but you also have to be fair-minded you have to see both sides of a case before mm -hmm. you your client's side or whatever um, entity or person you're representing you're not going to be successful you have to anticipate it's like chess yeah anticipate what the other side is thinking and all of that so my mind is quite analytical and so i think those things will help me to get to where i am now but yeah, no, no one ever dissuaded me. It was something that my family, everybody who knows me knew I always wanted to be an attorney. And when I finally went to school and graduated, I had a lot of support from my family and community. And even until now, I've never really done a lot of advertising, but I still have a lot of clients because people just kind of know this is what I'm about. Well, knowing what you're about, and so what do you think, what do you think, why do you think they come after you or they, they seek your services? Um, is it just because they know what you're about or is there so, so certain qualities about you that stand out? I think there are people who have recommended them to me who say, I think others want a familiar face mm -hmm. um, that they can tell all their confidential secrets to and knowing that they're not going to move from you know my brain right. to anyone else's um, ears. And, um, they take advantage, believe it or not. Um, they assume that they'll get a discount with someone who looks like <laughs> different reasons. You know, I um, somehow tonight, uh, the connection is like beating up on us. But we are troopers. Oh, no. You're a trooper and so am I. And, and we are going <laughs> to do the show. Um, so, you know, I... I'm hearing all this, you know, you started you, you, uh, when you were young, you knew what you wanted to do, and you went to school, you um, took the bar, you got a culture shock, and so on, and, you know, you explain what this culture shock is like. Um, you started working for a private firm, or you, where, where did you start working before you went into private I, practice? I went, I attended Temple undergrad. I received a bachelor's of I worked for about a year and then I came back to New York and I got a job at a very large law firm named White and Case. And I worked there for a year while I was applying to law school. Mm -hmm. Attended law school, I knew I did not want to more involved with the day-to-day -day dealings with clients as opposed to a big corporation. So that's, um, that was my intent when I attended law school and graduated. And, and so when, when did this entrepreneurial bug hit you? Did, when you graduated from high, uh, law school, did you go into private practice right away or? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you take the bar exam. I took it in July. We didn't receive our results until November. So mm -hmm. I worked with some of my professors who took a liking to me and interest in me mm -hmm. um, until I found that I did actually pass the bar. I was sworn into the bar April of 2003, April 9th. And I think I had my first case by April 11th. You uh, know, it was just waiting for my paperwork to come. And a person who wanted to work for someone else. Mm -hmm. So I knew pretty early on that that wasn't what I wanted to do. The firm life um, has a and for me for the long term. Uh, we didn't get that. The firm life has a what? The firm life has a lot of perks. Oh. Mm -hmm. A lot of benefits. Um, and actually not so much now because with the recession, things have changed greatly. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do with my career in law. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a partner at the firm write me a recommendation letter and I, I would still attend law school after being at the firm because he thought it was insane because the, the um, profession is so stressful mm -hmm. that he couldn't imagine that someone who had seen it up front would still actually go and attend law school and want to practice. And I explained to him that not everyone worked the way those attorneys did. So for me, I want to tell people in my community, you know, my mother was a single mother. She had to go to family court. I had cousins who had been deported. I had friends who have been arrested. Mm. The corporation just make more and more money. And again, in my own life, there were things that I had done that I just didn't get in trouble for. Mm -hmm. It's the only reason why I wasn't sitting across the desk for myself. So I wanted to assist those those persons. I like that. I, I, I like that your environment 
uh, you know, sort of informed your, your, your decision or your yeah. choice rather. I like that and I like that. I, you know, I, I, I don't like writing questions though. I don't believe in it. I, I love the organicness of having a conversation with people and, um, and I love to follow the flow. And you mentioned, you know, um, people in your, your environment, your, your neighborhood, your family, had um, situations that require legal uh, counsel and so on. And you were driven to help these people, so to speak, to provide this service. And I like that. And I mean, I hope that any young person that is listening tonight is, you know, is paying attention to this, that it is not only about, it's not really about me. It's about others, you know. Yeah. The, the, you know, the money comes and to me, I also want to make this quick point and go back to it, is that many people um, want to get rich to become successful, but money pursues success. And I like, I like the idea, really, uh, that you, I mean, could have gone and worked for a law firm, but you decided to go on your own. But it wasn't about just make, about making money alone. It's about providing a service to those who cannot help themselves or couldn't afford one of the big attorneys. Um, Jasmine, I, I think on that note, I'll take a break and okay. you know, continue on the other side. Okay. All right. We are back. Um, I'm Selwyn Collins of CWS for those who are now joining us. My guest this evening is Jasmine Edwards. Jasmine. I yes, Selwyn. <laughs> Sorry. Um, That's okay. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, want, I want to ask you about some of your challenges, um, especially as a student. What, what were some of the challenges you had as a student? Hi. Did we get freeze out again? The foundation that I had as a student was not really any different from my counterparts in school, regardless of their backgrounds or anything. Jasmine. It was about the... Hold, hold a second. I, I'm so sorry to do this, but... Um, That's okay. Be because it's it's sticking, the, the, the audience not, not hearing your full sentences. Can we go back to um, start over the, the question, what were some of your challenges as a, stu as a student? And all, I, all, I, all we heard was the foundation. Did you really start right. from there? That my challenge was really myself. Mm -hmm. 
I was fortunate to have a good foundation in terms of my education. And so I didn't feel like I was at a disadvantage um, with my counterparts in school who may have gone to different schools, quote unquote, better schools or anything like that. It was about me sitting down and saying, it's Friday night, you know, it's May, I wanna go out and hang out with my friends, but I have a final. Am mm -hmm. I gonna go, am I gonna stay home? So it was about self-discipline. So for me, it was really just a fight with myself, no third parties. And how, no. how did you get through that? What were some of the principles you adopted? Well, I mean, to me, law school was hellish. Um, it was a means to an end. The bar was even more hellish, and I knew I didn't want to repeat it. You know, they you graduated in May. We had a big party. It was one bar. So the best time of the year when you're finally finished with school, mm -hmm. and by now I'm a grown woman. I have my own apartment. I'm reverted back to staying with my mom to study you know, for 20 hours a day, it seemed mm -hmm. like I was not going to repeat that process. So mm -hmm. for me, it was just about sitting down and studying for that bar to make sure that I passed it to move on. But I reached out for it. We had a writing center at the school. I went. Any professor that said, come talk to me, I went. About getting the help that I wanted and needed. For internships, same thing. I wanted to do entertainment the back of a CD to see who represented Puffy, mm -hmm. as he was called back then. I'm not sure what his name is now, but how I get to do what you do. Um, I think a lot of people wait for things to be handed to them, and that's not the way the world really works. So you have to be aggressive and kind of go out and handle your own business. So it's, are you an attorney? Even now, how, how old are you? They ask you that question. We stuck. We stuck yeah. again. I'm sorry. We are stuck again. They ask you how old are you, Jasmine? Yeah, I don't they, know. My my computer is giving me an error message for the internet. Um. All right. Let's let's just relax for a bit and see if it goes away. Our audience is patient. It's okay. Yeah. Is it? Is it, does it free up? I can hear you, Selwyn. You, right, okay, I, I can hear you too. Um, okay, good. I was asking you to repeat the part where you said they would ask you your age. Oh yeah, they would ask me, I remember going to criminal court for the first time, I got there very early, which is like nine o'clock. The courtroom was completely empty and the court officer asked me for my ID again. Now usually when you enter the courthouse, they ask you for your ID at the door and mm -hmm. then once, once you get to the court, if you ask somebody for a file, I asked you, but he wanted to actually see my ID. And his response was that he had never seen me before, as if he were the gatekeeper of attorneys. You know, they, as I mentioned earlier, there were 10,000 people who took the bar mm -hmm. specific date, and then anyone can get sworn into the New York bar. But, he, you know, for him, there's a young sitting as a defendant, but instead you're an attorney. Um, so those kind of, but I've, I've given up that fight. Hmm. Um, well, and, and well, you know, I was, I was my, my next, this, my segue was going to be challenges as an attorney, but um, you, you've given us, you've given us a few. Um, well, I'm sure, I'm sure you have some more in your profession, some challenges as being an attorney, especially representing, um, being in private practice, representing yeah. uh, people that you know, um, you know, people that you're familiar with and so on. What were some of those challenges? Well, some of those challenges are that, I think, well, there, there are a couple. One, some people still see you as little Jasmine, you know, so even though they're calling me as a grown adult, <laughs> they still see me as a not that anymore so they the other challenge is always getting paid oh can you do me this favor it's like look i i would love to but i can't tell my landlord can you do me a favor and not charge me rent mm -hmm. so that's always a challenge um and then you know can you notarize this form for me that you know you're not supposed to notarize but because your family or friends 
Uh-huh. So um, it's really more ethical and economical issues that I run into. But when I can, I other than that, what is it for? If I can't help those people, what you know, what is it all for, really? So you you're really passionate about that. You're really committed. Oh, yeah. To this kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let, let, let me let me let me ask you this question I, before I get into to what I was thinking about. Who who would you say has the uh, has the greatest impact on your life today and why? My mother. Your mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely my mother. I know it's cliche, but it's true yeah. for me at least. Yeah. Um, my mom had me when when she got pregnant she wrote her mother a letter saying i'm finally in menopause thank you god so she thought she was done (laughs) surprise here i am so she had to at the time she was a graduate student at columbia university Mm -hmm. um she was living a life of a single woman in the city and it didn't work out the way she planned but she had to always been my role model she um she loves culture as much as she loves soca me she was what she loves high culture Mm -hmm. between you know just how she is so um i always respected her and the way she handled her life um and her future for herself so she and my biggest influence so the sacrifices that she had to go through to get me to where I am, I always try to make her proud. Wow, I like that. Um, let's talk a little bit about service. You know, you seem very passionate about it. Yeah. Um, what does service mean to you? Yeah. Service to me over the years has changed. Um, when I first finished undergraduate school, I was a social worker. I worked with um, families who had uh, been accused of neglecting or abusing their children. And I would go into these people's homes to try to help care for their children. Meanwhile, I had no children. Mm-hmm. The school, they should be clean, they should be well fed. But there's so many issues behind the neglect that it's it's almost impossible for a single social worker to address them all. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to kind of be behind that so that I could, um, you know, better affect what would happen with their futures. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when I go into the criminal court, especially the criminal and family court really, really make me very sad. Because when I go there, I see a lot of young people of color who are very comfortable in court. They don't seem nervous. They don't have suits on. They're not crying. It's like, you know, you see your friends there and you hang out. And I, I don't know when that happens, you know. Um, so for me, at this point, practicing service meant giving them good legal advice. But at this point, I prefer to be more proactive. I don't want to meet you in the hallway of criminal court because by then it's too late. So what 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 do you want to do, or what are you know? Well, what I've been doing over the years is going to speak to to students at school. Um, I try to encourage people to do estate planning. I do know your rights sessions. I um, this many of us are being deported. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you never know you're going to have to commit a crime. It just happens sometimes. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, today I'm going to get arrested and then I'll be deported, you know, soon thereafter. Life happens. Um, and so I'd rather be proactive. And so for me, again, at one point, legal help in court that they can get, but now it's changed to let me help them not be in court at all. Once you have to see an attorney, it's, if it's an estate, they're going to take a third of your family's money off the top and they'll do it gladly. If you're in criminal court, the DAs and the judges have mandatory sentencing. You're already going down the river. I can't really help you. I can talk for you. Mm-hmm. What you've been accused of, you can't afford to even fight this case. You know what I mean? Family court, same thing. You know, why not find an elder in your family or, or a friend in common that you can sit down and say, when can I visit with my child rather than paying some attorney thousands of dollars because of some vendetta you have against the mother or father of your child? Mm. Mm. 
but I'm, I'm over it. You know, mm-hmm. I, when I go to the family court, and there's only one in Brooklyn, and I see only black and Hispanic people, it enrages me. Where are the Caucasian people? Where are the Hasidic Jews? They all live in Brooklyn, but they're not in that courthouse. Oh, why? why? They must have family conflict, but we don't seem to have gotten a handle on how to deal with ours better. So I would rather be on the other side of Why well, then it's too late. You know, Jasmine, you know, this, this connection, you, you're, you, you are speaking so much truth to power and, and such so many interesting uh, and informative things. And I, I yeah, want you to speak yeah. some more on this, uh, really, because, you know, that's, an int- that's a very profound question. You know, I was about to ask you, is it because of demographics? And then you mentioned, no, I mean, they live oh. in Brooklyn, but they don't, you know, they don't go into these courts. So why is that? Um, I don't do know. I don't know. And, it, and it's amazing because a lot of my clients I've known for many, many years. And on the street, these people are so tough. You know, they they have the most guns, the most drugs, the biggest car, all of that. But when they get into court, it's like we're scared of white people. What we is don't talk up for ourselves. You know, we don't we don't know when to be tough and when to 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 kind of fall back. And I'm not sure when this happens. You know, um, so something happened. Some some. I mean, you know, our, our four parents and well, I'm not from here, but. You know, I, I can think of Malcolm X and Martin Luther and and, right. uh, and all these people, Stokey and Michael, all these people who fought for change and, and fought yep. for civil rights, basic civil rights. And, you know, today when I, and, and this is no slight on young people, but I'm from a different generation. I'm going to speak to it because I, I don't like it, walking with their pants sagging and so on and so forth. Right. And, you know, you see all these things and, uh, you know, as you mentioned just now, acting tough on the street, but when you get into court. Right. There's a whole different story. And right. You're, now you're a mouse. When you need to really, because you're talking about your freedom, mm-hmm. your family, your... Tell you how many mothers have come to me because their son is in jail. They talk to the attorney on their behalf. That's your son. That child was in... Connection. One of my family. I th- we we stuck. We got stuck there for like a few seconds. Uh, you said that's your child. Oh. That child was in you. What? What? Yeah, that 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 child was born from your physical body, and for you now to be. Stand that concept. Mm-hmm. You know. You know. You know, Jasmine. She's I'm going to say 16, this. To m- I, I'm going to say this tonight, right, uh, for both of us. Um, and I know it's because of the weather yeah. that you had to do Skype tonight. And with Skype comes different challenges. Um, I need you. I would need for you to come into the studio one day. because I, what I, I would love to. What you have to say is so very important and so very profound. And I, I, I really want the audience to hear this because many of us you know those of us who don't have children we have nieces and nephews and cousins and so on and you right. s- mentioned something just now it's not only about when you commit a crime or being accused of a crime or whatever it's not just you it's the no. family and other people that get affected and yeah. you know it's it's eroding our society our communities um mm. and i really would like you to talk a bit on on the whole family family court issue that is very important and deportation because that affects families in ways i mean i was in guyana for christmas and you know the the deportation issue is a big issue some of these people have you know they've left guyana when they were kids they know nobody in guyana they don't know anything about guyana and, and, and guyana is not the only country that they, people get deported to, but we're, talk, we're Guyanese, so we're talking about Guyana. And they are sent back home. And then what do, they, what do they do? What can they do? You know, they have to survive somewhere. And so right. as a result of that, crime, crime escalates, you know. Yes. You know, so um, I, I really want to, want to talk some more about this. But 
you know, who, who do you who do you believe you impact? I mean, it's almost unfair to ask that question because you were talking about, you know, mentoring and giving speeches and you know giving talks and so on. But for those who are listening, if someone wants to do that, how did you get started in going to the schools and how did that happen? What's the process? Did you hear me? Working. Oh, we got stuck again. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. That's all right. It's, all, it's okay. Right. It's okay. Um, but um, I, I basically did research on the different schools. Um, I always tell people now the most important thing for you to focus on is the LSAT. And the LSAT is the, the test that you have. So with your LSAT score, scripts and all of that, your work history, you will be admitted to law school or not. Score on the LSAT, the better law school you can enter, the better chance for you to get whatever job. Mm -hmm. When I was studying for the LSAT, I didn't take it that money. And I really didn't care that much. I know I went through it in law school, but I certainly didn't um, put my all into it. And so when I got my score back, it was in the middle and I could have applied to a bunch of big schools, but at that time, even I probably, my mentors at the time was working at the firm mm -hmm. um, and they would bring in about 200 summer associates. And that's every Asian, black, they had three, that's it. And he said to me, listen, if you're not gonna go to Yale or Harvard, just go wherever I chose to go to CUNY Law School, which is in school. So it was in line with what I wanted to do anyway as a former social worker. And it was, I think I paid like $4,000 per semester versus 40000 for my sister who went to UCLA. Wow. So um, it was a choice that I made because I knew I was not looking for a firm to give me a job. Mm -hmm. So you, it, I always tell people, start at the end of what you want to do and work your way back. If you know you want to work at White and Case, you everything's on the internet. They will tell you where their associates have graduated from, what their credentials. That person, you can get that job. Mm -hmm. If you want to work at Legal Aid, you do the same thing. For me, I wanted to work for myself, so I really didn't care. You know, I needed my degree. Let's pass the on. Um, so I, I was never ashamed, and even now, I'm not ashamed to ask anyone a question. I'm quite aggressive when I want something and I, you know, you, you have to kind of, you have to humble yourself. Mm -hmm. And as attorney, the first couple of times you go to court, you will be humbled because the judge will ask you, where did you go to school? Really? What are you talking about? Miss Edwards? Yeah. I mean, they'll, they'll cut you down in five seconds. You have to take it on the shoulder and keep it moving. So with that, you have to build a tough skin. And so you can't be a, afraid or ashamed to ask people questions about how you can move forward. I mentioned earlier that a, um, an attorney came into my classroom when I was in school, and this is over 11 years ago. Her name is Ellen Edwards. I spoke to her up to last week because after class, I approached her and said, I want to do what you're doing, and we're still in contact until this day. So a lot of people took an interest in me because I took an interest in myself. I like that. I, I love that. Somebody to say, oh, you look like you might be successful. Let me try to help you out. It doesn't go like that. What are you bringing to the table? So I always would approach people that I thought I could learn something from, and I would hang around them, you know, and, and people welcome that, you know, and, and eager, an eager student um, will definitely find a good teacher every time. I like that. I mean, you, you, you are, you are, you're so wise. I mean, you're really dropping some pores of wisdom here tonight. I especially like the the principle of stepping out and, you know, you step out first and, you know, it, it, it speaks to that adage that God helped those who help themselves. You Absolutely. you reach out first and people will, you know, see what you're doing and, and, and help you rather than go out begging for hands, hands out. I like that. Right. So um, how, how are you, how were you as a, a mentee? You spoke of humility just now, but... How were you as a mentee? As a mentee, I think I was pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I had a professor who, she even asked me to house sit for her. That's how, that's how fond of 
side drive and like one or so I'm like of course but I was eager to learn from anyone um, the next attorney I worked for did immigration law um, he's of Jewish descent mm-hmm. first person that he hired ever after practicing for 25 years so I think that kind of trust that he would put into me um, speaks for itself but I was fortunate to have all types of jobs as I was growing up I've worked at Costco I've worked at Home Depot I've worked in offices I've worked in schools and so I can do everything in my office from soup to nuts I'm not that attorney who can't type their own memo I can do everything myself but I can manage my staff as well so I think work hard people will respond to that and they will be willing to help you because if you're if you're going to rest on your laurels once again people don't really want to inherit another issue because we all have our own you're <laughs> repeat that jasmine for repeat that yourself better repeat. somebody's going to say you know what this person is about their business let me see what i can do to push them along but if you're like oh help me you know i don't know what to do it's, it's not going to work <laughs> I, I was asking you to repeat that first part i mean we heard it but it is so profound um People don't want another issue. No, we all have our issues. Everybody has problems with their spouse, with their kids, with their bills, with their parents. I don't want to inherit another issue. <laughs> I already have that. I have that under control completely. You know. So when you see someone who's trying to get ahead um, and at least has an intent to do better. Yes. Uh, actually, one of my friends who's sitting in my shop now, he's a customer of mine, and we were talking this morning about how he could do better in his own business the fact that he has the intent to want to do better he's going to do better I agree. but if, him, if he came in and said oh god i'm not making any money woe is me. he came in and said what can i do to be better in my business and i think we've lost that we want people to come we want we, pe- we want ourselves we want people to rescue us yeah, it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. The The lifeboat is not coming. It's not going to happen. So you better learn to swim then. You better learn how to swim. You better get some CPR under your belt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. So I, and, and I asked this question about you as a mentee. And it leads into how are you as a mentor? As many questions as you have to ask me, I will certainly answer. Uh-huh. Um, no, I was, I was saying, how, is, how are you as a mentor? Any questions that someone has for me, I will certainly answer. Oh, 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 answer. gotcha. Sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. I, sorry. That's okay. I'm sorry. I've been involved with 100 Black Women, um, the Harlem chapter, for many years. And every a mentorship program that's sponsored by L'Oreal. And if you want to be whatever it is, fill in the blank, they will send you to the office of that person for at least a day, sometimes longer, to just kind of see what they do day to day. So I always tell the people who come to me, you have to stay in touch with me. So if you come to my office for a day, Uh email, send me a text. Don't send me a a recommendation to law school when I haven't talked to you, you know? So they're just little things that I think um, are not taught in school anymore by parents anymore that I try to impart to the people that I mentor. So Her. I've had mentors, you know, mentees for 10 years who are now friends of mine. Wow. Um, but yeah, I've done it all from the beginning to the end. So I, I think I'm a very good mentor because I've lived life. I haven't had a picture perfect life. But who does? Who has? Um, I, I want to go to the chat room. Kali, Kali asked, uh, thanks for sharing so candidly. What are the advantages that you benefited from by pursuing a law degree in the manner that you did? The advantages that I've had, um, really the number one advantage is to pick and choose who you want to represent. I'm able to plan my day in any fashion that I choose. I hear someone's story and I want to take their case, I can take it. There's no supervisor telling me I have to take it or that I can't take it. Mm -hmm. So law school gave me the freedom to really plan my own life. And the information that I learned there 
can never be taken away from me. So um, the advantage is really information. So um, Kali asked again, uh, looking back at your job experiences, do you see a pattern of how things ca came to you? A pattern, I'm sorry, I missed part of the um, Looking back at your job experiences, do you see a pattern for how, for how things came to you? Yes. Um, I think that if you ask for help, you'll get it. So I would always tell people I'm looking for a job. Do you know anybody who has anything? Um, and they would say yes or no. So um, things have come to me because I've pretty much asked for it or gone on after it. Uh, um, when I got a job at the law firm that I mentioned before, mm -hmm. it was because I had written to many different agencies when I was still in Philadelphia. Mm. I, and I, I had to go on a lot of interviews to get that job, but I did. Um, so reach and, out um, and, and ask. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Ask and you shall receive. You may have to ask 20 times, but at some point you, you will get what you're asking for. But you have to be, you have to persevere. You can't. Don't always fall into your lap. Um, the first job I got out of college was because I saw one of my friends off campus who said, oh, I'm working at XYZ place and maybe you can get a job there too. I got the information, I called right away uh -huh. and I was able to get an employment that way. Um, when I was finished with law school, one of my health did for her said, you know, don't 40 grand a year, you can do this on your own with help of attorneys who are practicing. And I did that. Sometimes I regret it, but I think it was the best thing for me to do. Um, and it, it's worked out to my advantage. So I think the first thing is knowing what do you want to do? Um, what do you want to do? And once you've defined that, then you will go after the opportunities that will further those objectives. But you can't do it for your family or friends or what's going to look good or look bad. You have to first know what you want to do and then go after it. So, you, so you're not influenced by what people are going to say, who is going to laugh if you fail. You, you're not influenced by those things. I'm only asking these questions for the, for the young people that are listening. I'm not saying that I'm not influenced, but it, it doesn't influence me more than what I want for myself. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. So it's not that I don't hear that that... I'm still going to be number one. So the thing that you want, the, th the thing that you want or you're going after has to be greater than your yes. fear of the, the, the ridicule, the consequence and you know, the negativity. I like that. And, and Kali said, loving that, loving that you are emphasizing the power of intention. Yes, the power of intention is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And there are times that you are going to fail. There are times that I walked out of court like, damn, <laughs> that hurt, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you have to keep it moving. You know, what are you going to do? Go on. Okay. Beginning yeah. or even during, you know, so you have to just kind of keep focused and keep talking to yourself about your self-worth and what you want to achieve for yourself. Keep focused. That's what you said before. Keep focused, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Focused. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And is there anything about law particularly that you love? Yeah, I mean, with law, I love the fact that I can educate my clients mm. because there's so many little things that we just are not privy to. You know, if you're sitting around the table and your father is a law professor and your mother is a judge, you're gonna have a very different conversation than if your mother's a home health aide and your dad's not there at all. Right. You know, things that may seem to be second nature to others that we just don't have a chance to experience. So um, the fact that I'm able to tell people, no, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like that service and, and- You know, for me, I have no problem Let's try to get you back. I'll take a break and then um, when Jasmine come, can reconnects, we'll continue the conversation. So, and ha, oh, you're there. 
Yeah, uh, my my computer was saying they were trying to reconnect the call. Okay, all right. We can we still we have audio. So Okay, very good. Um, so yeah, I was saying we we kind of lost audio. Let Jasmine. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? What I'll do, I'll take a break. Okay. And you call me back during the break. Okay. On the on the landline? No, no, no. No. Call call me okay. back through Skype. Okay. Okay. CWS for those of you who are now joining my guest tonight is Jasmine uh, Jasmine you can can you still hear me I can still hear you okay good we have no video but that's fine um, okay. someone in the chat room asked what led you to become a trial attorney my clients <laughs> <laughs> Um, when I started practicing, I thought I would only do immigration, which there there are some trial and litigation aspects to. As you have a client and they feel comfortable with you, uh -huh. so you do you do a green card case, and then they're gonna buy a house, and they want you. They don't care if that's not what you do. They want you, and then they get married, and they need a prenup, and they want you, and then they get divorced, and they want you. And then, you know, there's child support and they want you. And then their mom gets sick and they want you. So my, my clients have been the ones to direct my career, not me. I like that. I like that. Again, if service. trust in you, you mm -hmm. kind of, you know, you have to, yeah, you have, to, what are you going to tell them? No. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's how my, my, my practice has really been driven by to dictate 
how and when I can help them. So it's something that I really cannot do or I'm totally uninterested, then I'll tell them that. But for the most part, as they come to me, I help them. And if that means a trial, then so be it. Hmm. And Susan, Susan asked, are you involved in mentoring advocates of child juvenile and the child or juvenile in the court system? Do you have any advice given your experience? I do not mentor anyone like through the court, if that's the question, like any kind of pro. My advice is that if you go to, I don't know the exact web address, but if you Google or search on the internet for the unified court system of New York, mm -hmm. they have volunteer programs and they have all kinds of opportunities of persons who are interested in helping in that way. Um, my mentorship there really extends with my clients ah. and trying to advise them not to use their child as a pawn because the damaging effects are, you know, they're, they're life lasting. Whoever you laid down and had a child with, that child did not ask for that parent. That's who you chose to be a parent with. And so don't damage the children in the process when things don't work out. And um, Programs, but I'm just not involved with that. I see. I, I, <clears throat> I want to touch the other part of the ad. Um, if I knew what I know now about law. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that about law, I would tell, and this is really coming from a person who worked as a solo practitioner. Uh -huh. So if I had worked in a firm where they took care of billing and filing and all that stuff, it would probably be a different um, experience. But for me, being my knowledge of law kind of takes a back seat. If you don't have a proper accountant, you're dead in the water. Mm. If you don't have a good paralegal, you're dead in the water. So you can know the law all day. You know, you could pass the bar, you could have the best grades in school, but if you don't have good business acumen, you're not going to make it. When I was in school, we used to laugh at the people on TV, like Jacoby and Myers and Salino and Barnes. That was a joke because attorneys who are about their craft don't have to advertise on TV mm -hmm. in the money because they're able to sift out the cases that are no good, take the ones for the most money and laugh all the way to the bank. So you do have to have a business acumen. So if I would say certainly partnering with someone mm -hmm. is a great idea, but you have to partner with someone who's going to piggy. So if both of you have no desire to do paperwork, you're going to be in trouble. You know, somebody of that issue because it's not just about knowing the law you have to know how to navigate a business and there are a lot of things that are entailed there that we our families are not always in a business for ourselves and so you have to kind of learn as you go and it can be very um disheartening if you don't have the right assistance yeah i i i, I totally agree with that you know there are times when you just want to practice and practice yeah. your craft and do what you want to do and don't can't be bothered with the logistics and the administrative right. stuff but those are the impo those are the the engine make up the engine of any any service um, Absolutely. It, <laughs> i want to ask you get a little point what 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 is fun to you what do you do for fun for fun i sleep <laughs> i eat <laughs> i dance you dance yeah, nothing exotic. I'm huh? um, in the club, I dance at the bar, wherever. If I can dance, I do it. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, before I started this business, I would go on long vacations, but now I haven't been able to do that. But I love to you love we didn't shut get down it. my brain when I'm away, when I'm away from my business. So uh -huh. Yeah, so for fun, that's what I do. I'm just like anybody else. And sometimes I'll see a client in the club and they'll be like, you know, you have to go off scene. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so you talk about your business. You talk about talked about being an entrepreneur. Um, what is it you, what business are you in? What other, I mean, other than law. You just other than law. Mm -hmm that's downstairs from where my law office is we, we, we didn't get that other than law, a, what what I is it 
Jasmine. Oh, Brooklyn. It's downstairs from where my office A T. Could you repeat that? Oh, the connection. Can you hear me, Selwyn? No, I'm, the connection was bad just now. You okay. What was I the said name? That, I said. Are you? I'm not hearing you. Um, let's, let's take a quick break and I will try to. I'll call you back. Okay. I'll take a break and call you back. Okay. All right. Yes, you were telling us about the business downstairs. What what is it? Again? Yes. The business downstairs is a tea shop. It's named Mamzelle's Teas and Tarts. One lesson I learned in business that you always should open something or start something that you yourself would patronize. So there were times that I would spend my desk working on something. I didn't want pizza. I don't want a burger. And being from Guyana, there is an appreciation. So, appreciation um, for what? For you said tea, right? Yes. Uh -huh. You were a tea party at the work. So um, we started a business downstairs from where my law office is, where we serve high quality loose teas and West Indian patties to the people in Dumbo. It's a pretty eclectic community, but so far things are great. Uh, so where is this exactly? Where is, what is the address? It's between J and Pearl. J and what? High Street. And we get our patties from Tota's Bakery on Utica. Their Guyanese Bakery. I'm sorry, Jasmine. And then I, our I, teas, I, we have about 28 varieties. I'm sorry, Jasmine. I didn't get the address. I, I, want, I want to get the address. Where is it exactly? 145. 145. Front, front Street. Crown? Front. F. R O N T Front Street. Uh huh. Yeah, it's between J and Pearl Street, and what's known as Dumbo. It's down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. So oh, okay. it's by the waterfront. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. So yeah, let so, me just let me just repeat that. It's one four to five Front Street between J yeah. and Pearl, um, uh, J and Pearl Street, and it's in Dumbo, down by the waterfront, right? Yep. Good. Yep. Yep. That's correct. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to come back to, to the, the whole tea business and what is, you know, what drove you sure. and inspired you and all that. Um, I just want to go to the chat room. Pat asks, what, ha what lessons have you taken from your law practice that have helped you in your new business? That have hurt me? No, no, no. What lessons have you taken from your law practice that have helped you in your new business? I'm thinking, um, there are a lot of lessons. I think, um, the main one is if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Ooh. Um, people scoff at business plans. They are a pain in the butt. They take a lot of time to complete what you're going to do and what you want to do. At some point, a problem is going to hit you is you're not going to be you're going to fail. So you have to plan. You must. You must. And one of my friends told me that years ago, and we laughed at him. I'm not writing a business plan. I don't have time for that. You know, I know what I need to do. And now he's... Sorry. He's... Not because he's so much smarter, but oh. because he has learned to take the time to plan his... So you really have to sit down and plan exactly what you want to do for your business. Not that you're going to comings or pitfalls, but it'll help you. We are and be um, more solidified. We are um, we are we are get we we got fits and starts. You know what I want to ask you, Jasmine? Is your cell phone on? My cell phone. Uh -huh. um, 
Yeah, I'm sure it is. Try try taking that off and see what happens. I learned this a while ago. I was okay. yeah. All right. Okay, let's go back to your friend who um, wrote a business plan or advised you to write a business plan and you were right. hesitant. Tell us about that. Right. One of my friends that I went to undergrad with, he started a t-shirt company. Mm -hmm. And at one point, one of my friends and I had a, a fashion line. And he said, the best thing I tell you to do is write a business plan. And we're like, oh, please, you know, we know all about fashion. Our designs are hot. Forget a business plan. And we didn't listen to him. And we should have, because if we did, we'd probably still be in business now. But sitting down and writing out exactly what you want to do, what your objectives are, who your competition is, puts you in a mind frame that you have for yourself before you even open those doors. And I think people try to jump into things too prematurely. And in the end, you you may pay for it. Not everybody, but a lot of times you may. Um, so if you're serious about your business, other people will take you serious as well. Yeah. So, you know, you just have to do that legwork. And if you're in it for the long run, which you have to be in a business, it's not going to harm you to sit down and write what your plans are for a couple of months. And once you're done with that, you can move forward with some information as opposed to just your gut feeling or your um, talent. Because if you don't nurture your talent and protect it, it's worthless. <laughs> Jasmine, you're coming back on CWS. You know that. <laughs> you, you, I mean, seriously, I'm sitting here and I'm enthralled and like, you know, connection is trying to beat up on us here tonight. And, you know, I know. And, and you, you have so much positive and so much good information to, to share. Um, why did you choose? Well, you said you, you, why, you, you said you, you chose it because you believe that you should get into business with something that you, you usually use or usually do. Is, is that, I didn't get that in the, uh, when you mentioned right, it. Right. Mm. So, so basically for me, there were times that I was at my desk and I wanted to go <coughs> and get, yeah, a cheese roll and a cup of mango tea, but right. there was no such place that existed. <laughs> you can get a cheese sandwich and some Lipton tea, but that's it. And so I created a business with my partner that we knew we would patronize ourselves. Right. And so because of the passion that we have for it and the response that we would give, if we were walking into the same establishment, we've been successful. It's only been a couple of months, but so far so great. So you can't do things just for the money. So if you wouldn't want, if I'm sitting here drinking Starbucks every day, mm -hmm. there's a problem because you have to be behind your product. It has to be something that you yourself is interested in acquiring or purchasing or being involved in. And once you have that and you plan properly, things will usually fall into place. I, I like that. I, I do believe in planning and I do believe in believing in your plan, believing in your service or your product. Right. You know, and, you know, things have a way of falling into place. Yes, you, you plan. And, yes. you know, you plan for all sorts of situations and so on. But to me, I also believe that when you, you step out, things, you know, rather than sit back and say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think I can do this. I, I, I don't have all the pieces together. Sometimes when you step out, the, t the, the pieces fall into place. As you said before, people, if you do for yourself, people respect that. And they tend to, to, yes. to, to assist you or lend you a hand or something. But you have to, you have to start the ball rolling. Um, what do you like most about your business, about this whole thing? Um, about the tea shop or the law office? The tea shop, the tea shop, sorry. So the best thing I like is that there are our customers have become our friends and it's a refuge. So when you're having a stressful day at your desk, you can come down and get something good to eat, something nice to drink, some good conversation. We watch all kinds of movies here. We watch Kill Bill. We watch fashion movies. We watch the news. You know, you can just kind of come down and have an intelligent conversation with like-minded persons. You can go back to your desk, to continue your day. So I like the fact that our customers have become our friends. I like that. So is there a conflict between you, your practice and 
you know, s- serving in a tea shop or working in no, a tea shop? No, not according to the ethics committee. <laughs> <laughs> but some of, some of my tea customers have become my legal clients as well, but that's okay. No, I, you know, I, I think I phrased that question wrong, but you being the brilliant attorney, you answered it that way. What I meant is, does working there impact or affect negatively your work as an, as an attorney? It, it, it impacts it in a negative way only because of the time that's taken away by this business. So oh. I'm still one person. Okay. There's still 24 hours in the day. So now that I've divided my time, you know, to devote to another business, obviously I don't have as much time to devote to my legal practice. Um, so basically I just pick and choose my cases more carefully because I don't have as much time to devote to those things in addition to the rest of my family responsibilities and my relationships and all of that. Um, but in terms of my client base, I don't think it's affected it in a negative way. So um, which give you more satisfaction, the, the tea shop or the law practice? Right now, the tea shop, because I can do both. Again, they're, they're, um, we have some friends that come every Thursday. We call it the Thursday night tea party. And some of them need legal help, too. So when we're ready, we just kind of take a walk because we're located in like a gallery and all. Uh-huh. And, you know, we can, I can still talk the law talk with them. And then we talk outside of the shop. But with the law office, it's me, a desk, and a lot of paperwork, you know. So the interaction is limited to I have a problem, help me now. Whereas with the tea shop, it's both. I just want some tea. I just want that pine tart that you have there. And sometimes they also want legal advice. So I think um, the tea shop is a better balance for my personality because people people coming to me always with a problem and a dilemma, it makes me sad sometimes. You know, you kind of take that into your spirit. Right. So the fact that people are not only coming to me with a problem, I think is better for me personally. So you, you have inadvertently created a an oasis then? For myself, yes. yes. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. That, I mean, you know, practicing law, you said this is the 11th year. 11 and, years, yeah. Uh, and, and then finding something that you love and going yeah. after it. And now it's rewarding you with, 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 the, with satisfaction, you know, um, rewarding you with comfort. You get, you're still getting to meet people and you're yes. getting to do something that you like to do. That, that, that is brilliant. That is, that is very brilliant. If if you had to do if you had to do it again do it all over again yeah you, you're you know you're an attorney you've been able to help a lot of people provide services that they may not be able to afford but it has its challenges and all these things and you know but if you had to do this over again knowing what you know now would you still do law right. I would or you I would, would. Mm-hmm. but I what I would do differently is that at the beginning of my career I would have tried to do more education of the community so again you talk to people about how does one get deported and how can you prevent that what can the police really do when they stop you and frisk you you know what are your rights because that can prevent a lot of issues as well when you give people knowledge come to you a lot of times your hands can be tied i'm a big one for estate planning i've seen so many families torn apart by you know there's no will and so now you have all these issues that you have to deal with after the fact. So I think I would have just been a lot more proactive at the beginning of my career to educate my clients so they wouldn't necessarily need an attorney as opposed to where I try to help them. And sometimes it's already too late. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, 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 thanks for that. I, I'm, I'm just sitting here selfishly thinking you, you are coming back to CWS. Um, no problem. You know, <laughs> Kali, Kali asked, have you, how have your parents influenced your decisions in life? Um, my parents have just been very supportive of me. You know, I've gotten into a lot of trouble in my personal life, but in terms of my education and career, I've been pretty good. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're Guyanese, you know how they are. Right. <laughs> so that still works. <laughs> it, it still works out for them in the end. So they've been very supportive. Um, yeah, I, I don't have anything negative to say about that um my 
in my career. They've been there just to kind of help me along. And um, e, the connection lost you there just now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, yes. You know, I, I have to really thank the audience for their, their patience here. And thank you also, Jasmine, for, you know, being so patient, so uh, having such a, a good sense of humor about it. Because um, these are things outside of our control. The tea shop, what, what are your hours? Uh, yeah. Is it like early in the morning, late at night? What, what, what hours? Right now we're here from 11 to 6, but usually, like today I got here early and my customers came in early. Um, I'm here now. Somebody will ask for tea if they see me. So, you know, we're here from 11 to 6 officially, but if you come early, we may be here. If you come late, we'll probably be here too. Wow. We get new teas in almost every week. Um, and we're in a gallery and mall where there's a lot of shopping and very um, special, small businesses that a lot of my friends and family, when they come here, they're astonished at what's going on in this small little part of Brooklyn. So... I, it's I, worth the trip. I, I must I must come down there one day. I really must come down and see what this is all about. Um, yeah, you have to. I you will. have to come and have tea with us. Yeah. I will. I definitely will. Um, Callie asked, what was your inspiration for the tea shop? I just always had a love affair with tea. My mom is one of my best <coughs> friends, and we have traveled all over the city and all the, over the world having tea here and there. Uh -huh. Um, our favorite place, that, well, we have two favorites, well, three. There's one in Paris and two in Manhattan. Mm. Spend a lot of money to get a really good cup of tea, and you have to be dressed in a certain way, otherwise you feel out of character. <laughs> and so we wanted to bring that experience to a casual-type location. So if you have on sweatpants, come on in. If you're in your church best, come on in. So it's, it's, it's high tea, but in a casual setting. So really, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to bring that quality of tea to the masses. You don't have to um, feel out of place when you come here because it's for everyone. And uh, Kali, Kali asked uh, to tell us, tell us about the meditative aspects of drinking a cup of tea. Oh, man. Well, first of all, tea is usually made with hot water. Yes. And so you have to let it cool off. And so you must sit down and relax. <laughs> and a lot of times in our society, we're running so much that there's no time to sit down and relax. So when you drink a cup of tea, you have to let it steep. That can be four or five minutes. Then you have to let it cool off another four or five minutes. And by then, when you actually start to drink that tea, you've brought your own anxiety down. You've relaxed your own self. And the tea actually is very healthy. Um, tea has many, many health benefits in it that we're not even aware of. Um, a lot of antioxidants that can help you prevent certain diseases and certainly fight off things like colds and things like that. So um, there's a health aspect and also just an enjoyable um, component to drinking a warm cup of liquid that smells and tastes delicious. You know, you, you, you should write. Do you write your own marketing um, <laughs> material? I, my mother always says that I'm a true solicitor. <laughs> yes, Jasmine, you are. I, so, I, yeah, I, we do. We write all our own stuff. I drink, yeah. a, <laughs> I drink a lot of tea. And sitting here listening to you, I'm like, you know what? I, I, I'm going, I need a cup of tea. What's your favorite tea, Selwyn? Um, oh, I, I like Tulsi. Um, what, what is it? Tulsi, either mango, uh, red chai, masala. Okay. Uh, um, sometimes, um, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of like drawing a blank right now. Uh, okay. Um, we have we have about 28 different varieties of tea. So we have green tea, black tea, white tea, oolong. You oolong. name it, we have it. I like oolong too. This is great. Um, a question in the in the chat room. It's good. Let, it's good. I, I I am coming. I am coming. I I must come and uh, uh, to visit you, with you to and to patronize your 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 establishment, your business. I will. Um, Lynn said it's beautiful to hear a high powered attorney advocating the beauty of taking time out to have a cup of tea. Thank you. And Joan asked, where do you where do you source your teas? Right now we source. 
the our favorite and i hate to say it but it's true is ito n that's a japanese tea company and they're actually right around the corner so you know of course having a local supplier is wonderful <laughs> they supply us with our japanese green teas which have probably the most health benefits our second is harney and sons they're an american company they're located in upstate new york and they also have a shop in soho they have amazing blends of black teas, white teas, oolongs. And then we also get our um, teas from Tenren, which is a Chinese co company um, in Chinatown. Okay. Okay. We yeah. are working on our private label. You, you are? You're going to provide your yes, own? Yes, we are. You're going to provide your own tea? Yeah, because after, you know, we, we have our own love for the teas that we drink. And of course our, our customers come in and tell us what they like and what they don't like. And so we're going to develop a brand around um, our experience and our customer suggestions. I, I, I might be able to um, make some suggestions. I, I know of one person that um, actually manufactures tea and, okay. and, and you know, exports it all over the world is, is Guyanese. I'll, We'll talk offline. I'll, I'll make a connection there for you and yeah, see where this that'll be. Yeah, that'll be wonderful. I mean, we when we created our menu, we made sure to get teas from different um, backgrounds. So we have a tea that is from South America. It's from Ecuador. It's named Wayusa, and it has a lot of caffeine. So for people who want that caffeine kick, we have that. We have a tea from Kenya, which is very good with um, milk and sugar. It's kind of a, you know, a more British type of tea. Of course, we have French teas, we have Chinese teas, we have Japanese teas, but we try to represent different cultures in our menu. So a Guyanese tea would be perfect. Good. Uh, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to connect you. I don't, I don't know if it, it comes from Guyana, but he, you know, he cre creates his own blend and they're, they're natural, natural, um, herbs and all these kinds of stuff. So right, I'll, right. I'll, connect, I'll connect you. Joan said, um, do you serve asked, do you serve other drinks besides tea? No, we don't. We only serve tea. Okay. We, right now, we're only selling hot tea, but mid-March, we'll be selling iced tea as well. So for all the varieties that we serve hot, we'll be serving cold. Okay. But we're, we're sticking to tea. Okay. And Pat, would you cater a tea party outside of your shop? Absolutely. We already do that now. So, yeah, they should just call us up um, or email us. Give, give, us, give us. us your number. Give us your number. Zero. I, I didn't hear 3 that. 3884. Is it what? 718? 718. 698. 690. 690. 3884. 3884. The number is 718-690-3884. Seven one eight. No, six nine zero. Six nine zero three eight. Three eight eight four. Yes, Jasmine. Hello. Of tea parties, actually tomorrow we're going to be doing an office. Customers. So we do a lot of that work already in um, Dumbo. Okay. And um, thank, thank you, C. Someone posted the number, 718-690-3884. Okay. Pat, yeah. asked, Pat asked, give us some advice about making the perfect cup of tea. Well, the before perfect... that, before that, there, there's a comment before that. Pat said, fantastic that you're creating a customized brand branded tea for your shop. Congrats. And Thanks, then, Pat. Mm -hmm. And then Pat asks, give us, some, give us some advice about making the perfect cup of tea. To start with, don't do if you don't have it, but you definitely want a spring water because the taste is um, a cleaner taste to start with. Then you have to um, heat the water depending on the type of tea that you're going to brew. So mm -hmm. the white teas are brewed at 160 degrees. The black teas are brewed at a boiling point. So anywhere from 160 to 212 degrees, you want to brew your tea. And depending on what kind of tea, you brew it for either 30 seconds or up to five minutes. So 
let's say we were going to make a mango tea, uh -huh. we would brew that at 212 degrees for five minutes to get the perfect taste temperature um, for that type of tea. But uh -huh. um, if you if brewed it for five minutes, it would boil. The leaves are too delicate to handle that kind of temperature. So there is a science behind it. But you want to start with spring water. You want to have a clean kettle, obviously a clean cup, and always you want to use loose tea. It's far superior to what you find in bags because it's been kind of sitting around um, pure as a loose tea, and that's all we sell at our shop. Jasmine, you know, I, I say this every week, that when you tell a guest, it's hour and a half show. Sometimes they're like, wow, hour and a half, what can I talk about? <laughs> Yet time would always creep up for us, and it's 10 o'clock. It's actually 10.01. Yeah. I, and I, I want to, I'm going to ask you what I ask every guest. Um, first, A, are you prepared to come back? Absolutely. Wonderful, because we, we must talk about some of these law, law issues and social issues and so on. That's very important. Um, and... The, the, second, the second thing is, can you, you dropped a lot, lots of pearls of wisdom tonight. Can you just give one um, or a few words of advice, especially to young people that might be listening, or just, just a few words of advice? I think um, we all need to really listen to our instincts. Mm -hmm. We need to do the best that we can. You can't be lazy, and you have to follow dreams aggressively follow your dream. do not slow down do not but this this is america this is how jasmine play hard in the best way you can you're going to get run over and they're going to keep it moving you so said... you have to believe in yourself you have an idea you think it's good research it and follow it I so like... what if your mother thinks that it's a bad idea do what you have to do Follow your gut because it's usually right. I like that. And thank you so much, Jasmine. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and, you know, sticking, having a sense of humor about the connection. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> All right, this is, why, this is why you were so successful. Um, I, I am going to invite you to come back on. This time you will you'll come into the studio and we'll have a you know, hopefully an uninterrupted conversation. And thank you so much for the pearls okay. of wisdom, you know. Okay. And I just want to say this is Selwyn saying good night and see you next week. Uh, before I go, this month, uh, our guests will be only women. So next week and until the end of March, I want to bring on women in honor of Women's History Month. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being so patient. Thank you for listening. Good night. See you next week. Good night. Good night, Jasmine. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.